Hey guys, so we've got the 2018 secretary Max here for student talk. And yeah, um, I'll let him take it away. Sweet. Um, hey everyone, um, it's really, really good to be back. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in because this is a pretty quick talk. A um, few ground rules, you might go long, don't like, feel free to leave. Uh, also, ask questions as soon as possible because I don't want people not understanding some aspect of it and then we're kind of like building on that as we go along. Um, so yeah, this is kind of my a little little data visualization of my career. Um, I should have opened that to show that um, I generated it all in line. So um, you'll kind of see um, we're going to go through the kind of processes and structures um, that you can use for like basic data visualization, uh, basic intermediate data visualization. So a lot of the context behind this, and this is this is what we're going to cover uh, in this talk. There's a lot of stuff going on um, that at some point in time. Um, I expect everyone to pull up this notebook and kind of flick through it as a reference. Um, so before I but before I start, I wanted to go into like why why this talk of all talks. Um, recently, you can just ask an LLM to da like visualize a data set and it will work. Um, and um, a lot of what is now important for you to consider is like kind of the art of visualizing. Um, can you cram more information into a visual, uh, visualization? Can you make it not misleading? Can you make it interactive? Can you make it like look good? You know, that's a much more interesting aspect of the, the art of data visualization that an LLM won't do for you. Um, so another aspect of like why do it, right, is it's not just like, you don't do data viz because you're just bad at statistics. Um, ANSCOM Quartet is like, you need data viz and statistics. Um, so, the ANSCOM Quartet is like four different series, a bunch of data inside of them. And when we go to visualize them, we notice something really interesting about them is that they have the same statistical metrics, but they look like dramatically different data sets. Um, so any, any point in time you're getting any sort of data, don't trust it, make sure you visualize. So if that's the one big takeaway that you pull out of this talk, it's like you have no excuse to not do data visualization. You should be reaching at any point in time if you get any sort of data set, you should immediately pull the tools you have available to you. Um, so like, let's look at uh, the, the kind of graphing code that I'm using to visualize it. Um, we're going to get into what this interesting facet parameter does, um, but you can see it's a linear regression on the x and y parameters. Uh, I forget what CI does, and it's a dot plot. Um, also on the, the, the x and y encodings. So what framework I mean, am I using today? Uh, I'm using this one right at the bottom. I don't think everyone can see that. Let's zoom in a bit. Oh my god. There we are. <laughs> um, this is observable plot. Um, and observable plot, I think, is one of the more interesting um, graphing libraries because it's kind of like it has this very, very interesting lineage. Um, it's simultaneously D3, which had a lot of influence on a lot of different libraries, you know, Potley, Vega. Vega Light is still a very used data visualization library. Um, and it also is like dramatically influenced by the grammar of graphics and the kind of ggplot school. But you can kind of see that there is one very large school of the grammar of graphics school, and then you have this like kind of more like less influential, but still very popular um, MATLAB school of data visualization. Um, what is interesting, um, so we, we're going to talk about observable plot because it is part of this very big school, it's probably the latest, it's probably the most feasible. Um, so, grammar of graphics, like what is it? Well, it's made up of like three main components, um, marks, uh, encodings and scales. Um, what's very interesting about the grammar of graphics is it's actually really quite a primitive framework. It's very, very easy to implement anything that is compliant with grammar of graphics, um, which is actually a reason why it is so popular, why it's such a large part of that kind of family of um, graphing libraries, it's, it's just simple to, to implement. So what does that, what, what, what was the kind of render pipeline of, of a grammar of graphics library? Well it takes data um, and then what we, we use is we use marks and those marks generate encodings. And those encodings map to abstract space, then the abstract space is scaled and then that we use those scales to take the data and put it into screen space. Now let's Let's look at, let's break that down. That, that was a lot. This is a data set of uh, the relative frequency of letters in the English alphabet. Now, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the bar Y mark um, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a set of encodings. And so those encodings are saying that the letter is, is, the, is encoded as X, uh, the frequency of each letter is encoded as Y, and also the frequency is encoded as the fill color. Now, you can see what that does is it generates a data structure. Uh, and what is interesting about that data structure is it does include some very interesting uh, fields, which is channels. Remember those channels I discussed before? Well, let's pull those out. Um, and you can see what has happened is those values, those relative values, oh, sorry, those data, that data from the data set has been extracted out from the encodings and crammed into those respective channels. So you can see all those letters has been crammed into the X channel. Um, don't ask why it's Y2, it's too much to get into. Um, but you can see that those, all those, rel those frequency values, those frequency proportions have been crammed into the Y channel. And then finally, let's just, let's just graph it. So what we've done is we've, we've taken that bar mark, we've plotted it, we've plotted it with a caption and some colours. Um, and what's interesting, um, we'll get to this in a second, which is the scale. But this is what is <coughs> plotted onto screen space. It's just a, it's a bitmap, it's an SVG, um, it's not dynamic or reactive in any sort of way. Uh, it's a very, very primitive um, diagram. Now, first of all, remember those scales that I discussed in the middle? Going back to what we were looking at, so we have data, we have abstract space, and then we have scales. What's happened is the plotting library has synthesized scales based on the type of data that it saw. So in the Y channel, if you remember what the Y was, those were the relative proportions of the frequency, it synthesized a linear scale. And you can see that it's computed the domain, which was the, the, the range of the, well, not, I won't say the range of the data, but the interval of the data that came from the original data set. And it's calculated a range that is going to scale that data onto the screen space coordinates. That was a lot. Any questions? Okay, let's keep going. And so if you see, we can take the smallest value in our data set and then the largest value in our data set, and it gives us 370 and it gives us 20. Now, if we look at and we inspect element, the bar, we can see, oh god. Oh, come on. Come on. Screen space. Uh, 350. Um, why is it 350? Oh, because it's offset 20 from the bottom of the screen. <laughs> um, and obviously, I wouldn't say obviously, well, SVG's 00, zero coordinate is in the top left hand corner. So that's why the zero value is at 370 rather than at the top of the screen. So if we keep going, we'll go ordinal scales. So let's, let's say, well, let's get the X scale, the ordinal scale at the bottom of the screen. Let's apply the letter E, which is that big bright, bright green one, a bright yellow one right here. Well, what does it give us? Well, it says that when we apply E to that scale, it gives us 133. And what is the X position of that bar? 130. So you can see that scale is converting the, apps, the, the, the data in the channels into the screen space coordinates. And then finally what's happened is it synthesized another channel, uh, another scale, sorry, that's a color scale. And in this, in this color scale, if we take the largest value in our data set, that bright, bright, bright yellow bar, and we cram it into the color scale, we see that it spits out this yellow. That yellow was the color of the bar. So you can kind of see, if we, if we drill down into the kind of, ah, there we are, uh, if we kind of look at the kind of data flow of this whole system, you can see that what Leda has done is, is it, the, sorry, the bar Y mark is encoded from letter and frequency, the X, Y, and fill, ch fill channels. And then plot the framework has looked at those channels, it look, it's looked at the data, it's looked at the, the, the range of the data in, that, that, in those channels, and it's created and synthesized scales for them. And then those scales are then used to map the abstract data to the screen space, coordinates, and, and, and color, etc. And then the, the SVG elements are synthesized. So that's a kind of very, very basic data flow in any sort of grammar graphics frame. Now, those, there's those three main abstractions, scales, marks, and channels. We're, we're going to manipulate those in the grammar graphics. Now, we're not going to ma manipulate the marks. There's way, 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 way too many different varieties. You can kind of see if I scroll down through here, Observable gives me a bunch of different marks that I could possibly want to render stuff with. Not, it's not useful to kind of discuss um, that in this talk. Now, how hypothetically, let's manipulate the scales. Let's see what we can do with scales. This is a COVID data set. Um, 
uh, specifically in New York, and I have filtered it specifically to, oh, sorry, it's an all-state data set, I've specifically filtered it down to New York. Um, and so if you kind of remember the early days of COVID, um, there was that brief phase of exponential growth. Now, you can see that the scale here, Y, is linear. It looks linear, it, it appears to behave linear, um, and the domain um, is, you know, zero to the, the maximum COVID cases observed. We can change the scale to be log. And now you can see that beautiful, nice straight line where that exponential growth has become a linear line under, under the log scale. Um, but yeah, we can manipulate scales. That's something that the grammar of graphics permits us to do. And you can see um, the legend on the side, those ticks, has, has changed proportionally, um, accordingly. So what's happened is um, the plotting framework has looked at the Y scale. And you can see that the Y scale is no longer a linear scale, it's a log scale, and it's created a different tick scale accordingly. So you can kind of see the data here. Um, how did I override the scale? Well, I changed, I went to the, the, the Y option and I've, I've changed the type to, to log in this situation. And you can kind of see the line, you know, we've taken the filter data. We've bound the X to the, the date parameter. We've bound Y to be the, the, the positive case increase, the cases per day. So that's kind of the, kind of the code that's used to power that. Any questions? Cool, let's keep going. Next up, manipulating channels. Now, this is where all the really interesting stuff starts to happen. Because in an ideal world, well, actually, I wouldn't say in an ideal world, the thing you have to learn about using grammar of graphics libraries is they don't want you to clean data beforehand. A lot of people will take the data, they'll apply all their uh, manipulations to it, and then they'll take that data and they'll cram it into the potting library. And grammar of graphics libraries really don't like that. They want the data in its like unaltered form so that they can do a bunch of stuff to it. So for example, if you wanted to filter the data, this filter, what, what's very interesting, is it looks at the data, filters the data, um, after it's been, after the uh, scale has been synthesized for it. So let's look at, uh, I was meant to write some code for this one. This was meant to be some live coding. What was I gonna do? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, uh, hmm. give me a second. Let's do this. Do, 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 do. Uh, huh. Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties. Da, 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 do, da, da, do, da, da. There we go. Render that. Uh, huh. Okay. So if I pull in, if I start adding data to this this data set and trying to see how the linear aggression line responds into in, increased data quality. You can kind of see that the scales like wobble around a lot. That's like uh, kind of yucky. Um, but if I go back to what I had before, uh, it looks a lot nicer uh, because we're filtering after uh, the potting library has had a chance to compute the scales for it. So you can kind of see it actually knows um, what the total range of data is uh, on the y and x axis. So you can see that's kind of kind of a funky. Um, Funky animation. Um, yes, sorry, I forgot I, I, I wrote this. Um, so yes, uh, pot is encoding the channel, it's scaling it, and then it's filtering it. Um, so that's how it keeps those scales stable throughout that animation. Next up, um, this is a great one, binning. I'm a big fan of binning. Um, that's a strange statement. Um, here's a bunch of Olympians and their heights and weights. Now, this isn't a terrible diagram. Um, it's achieved very much with the kind of opacity that we've put on our dots. Um, but there's a nicer animation we can generate. Um, what if we were to come along and if we see, uh, we, we draw a like a grid, and if data falls into those little sections of the grid, um, we compute a bunch of statistics associated with it. Um, and you can kind of see as we kind of come along, we sweep our way through that uh, this, this, this data set. We've binned uh, into a bunch of grid squares and then we've changed, um, we've computed uh, a, a different fill colour uh, if more points fall into that little grid square. Um, that took too long, animation took too long to make. Um, so if we actually look at the code accordingly for that, this is, this is the, 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 the good part, this is the bad part, that's the dot plot, this is the, 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 the crazy little grid. Um, you can kind of see uh, what we're saying is we're saying, well, the bin, um, that is not relevant. Ignore that. The bin 
it, it has a bunch of thresholds, which is the kind of bin size. If we fiddle with the, the bin threshold size, we can kind of see, we can make the squares bigger and smaller if we want more granular um, wider bins. Um, we have a bunch of thresholds. It defines how, how big the bins are. We've bound the x y, we've bound the y height. And then what we're saying is, well, the fill, the fill should be computed based on the count of the number of things that fall into the bin. That makes sense to everyone? We could make that a sum, we could make that an average, we can make that a bunch of other what are called reducers. Um, in this case, the reducer we are using is count, and we've bound that fill channel. And so if we look at that kind of grammar of graphics pipeline that we're generating here, what's happened is, let's say we have a stream of 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, that's computing a new channel x of 1 and 4, because the bin, there's one bin, the center of that first bin is um, like uh, x1, uh, the x equals 1, and uh, the center of the next bin is x equals 4. Um, what is then happening, what has happened here? Um, I've forgotten what I was trying to get at here. Uh, da -da -da. Plot inspects the test sizes 1, 1. That's really weird. Um, I don't think that should be there. Uh, did it do it? Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties. Uh, okay, ignore that. So um, it, it's it's encoded one and four, one and four. It then scales that accordingly, um, and you can kind of see this kind of count channel is the number of items in each bin, um, and those have been bound to the abstract channel fill, and then Pot has then inspected the fill channel generated a color scale for it, and then ported a bunch of rectangles on the screen. Yes, which... Did anyone understand that? Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> um, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so bins don't have to, like in this case, we've got a bin. Bin is on two different linear scales, X and Y. Um, and it's uh, creating bins on those two different scales, the X and the Y. Now, we, what we could say is we could say, you know what, I only want a bin on one axis. So, this is a, what's called a barcode chart. Um, it pots, it's just saying, for example, in this case, it's just weight. And it's looking at the distribution of, of the weight. And if we, uh, if we see a certain weight, we just draw a line on that, on that axis. Um, now, this doesn't look very good. It's actually very useful for some um, data sets. Uh, but because this is like normally distributed, it just doesn't look very good at all. And also because it's quite, quite quantized, you know, they're only minimal steps. So let's apply this binning process again against this data set. And as we kind of sweep along, anytime we see one of these lines, what we do is we put it into a channel. Uh, sorry, we put it into a bin, and then we scale the bar height based on how many things fall into that channel, and we change the color of it based on how many things that fall into that bin. Sorry. So you can kind of see here. Um, this is that tick x, the, the, the bad version that we didn't really like. We're saying, you know, when we say tick x, we're saying it's a, it's a tick on the, the x-axis, along the x-axis. And we're saying for, for any, we're looking at all the weight values of the Olympians data set. Um, now in this case, we're saying, well, what we're going to do is we're going to bin on the, on the x-axis. Um, and the things we're, we're trying to bin are the, the weight values. Uh, and then we're going to scale a rectangle that's up in the y direction based on the count of things that fall into the bin and we're also going to color that rectangle based on the count as well. So you can, oh, I thought I drew a graph for that one, but I didn't. Um, it's kind of cool. Did that one make sense as well? So you can kind of see the bin, the bin is like a very, very flexible kind of abstraction. Yes? So there are reductions there, the counts. Yeah. Can they be arbitrary functions or only the ones listed? Um, I think they can be arbitrary. There's a bunch of um, there's a bunch like included by default, um, as you can see here. Um, I think you can compute one, but like the interface, like the, the function you use for it is like unequivocally gnarly. It's got like seven parameters. Um, so I just try not to. <laughs> um, hexbin hexbin is very similar to binning. Uh, it produces a cooler kind of diagram. I like hexbins. Um, the interesting part of hex bins is they have an extra parameter, which is like the like proportional area. Like you can see, some of these hex bins are smaller, um, and that's just like R parameter, this count, count, count 
that I've, I've provided. Um, so we can scale those accordingly. Um, and yes, I did do a graph for this one. Um, you can kind of see here, like we have a new, we have a new scale type, proportional area, um, because we've got count, we've bound the abstract channel R, um, we inspect that abstract channel um, with a proportional area scale, and that proportional area scale dictates the kind of size of the hex bits. Cool. Map. Map's cool. It's like, it's like a map, you know? It's like a, it's like a map function. Um, but the, uh, the cool thing is, it, it, it kind of applies to every sub-series um, in the data set. So this is a kind of depressing data set, um, Chicago crash deaths. Um, and so you can kind of see the cumulative uh, increase of deaths um, on a yearly basis. Um, now, you can kind of see how um, the, the, this kind of map reducer um, works. Um, we're using the cumulative sum um, reducer in this case. Um, and, you know, we're binding x, x is the, the, the date. That's just really gnarly code, I'm really sorry about that one. Um, and, but the really cool part is it's calculating a new cumulative sum based on the stroke parameter. And what is a stroke, a stroke encoding? Well, the stroke encoding is each individual year. So it's going to generate a bunch of different lines. And this is like kind of where the grammar of graphics starts to become like a really useful framework. Um, where what it's going to do is if it sees um, like different colours or different fills or that kind of stuff, it's going to start computing summary statistics on those individual series. If you complete, compute a median on a bunch of series, it's going to generate a bunch of ticks in a bunch of different spots for you. Um, so it's, a, it's very much built for this kind of statistical programming work um, that other visualization frameworks may not do. Um, so yes, you can kind of see we've computed um, this kind of map Y, we've computed this new, new data set, um, and then we're cramming that whole thing into the line um, mark, and then the line mark is using these new values. Um, I thought I did another graph for that one. I keep forgetting that. All right, select. Select is a great way to take some sort of channel and plucking out a single value and then drawing something based on that single value. Um, so for example, this one, this one says select the last value of this kind of abstract channel that was synthesized. So, you know, what is in this abstract channel? Well, it's a bunch of dates. Um, well, sorry, we're, we're selecting Mm. Yeah. Sorry. Let's start again. There's three separate channels getting derived here. Um, no. Yes. Four. We're getting. We're deriving four different channels based on the symbol. Um, and as you can see, this line is very similar. We're drawing four different lines in a different color based on the symbol. And those symbols are stocks. So what we're saying here is we're selecting the last value based on each symbol in the data set. And then we're going to give it the x value based on that data datum's x value and its y value, and then we're going to draw it somewhere on the chart. Uh, in this case, it's being used to draw the labels. That was not my best explanation. <laughs> Hopefully that made sense. Let's keep going, let's keep going. It's a really useful thing. Um, I should have explained it better, but it's really useful for generating a bunch of stuff. In this case, I've used that select mark to figure out where the median of this like area is. I've used it to figure out what the maximum value of this line is. I've used it to figure out, uh, I think this is something. I don't know, I, I, think, it was, mm, I think it was where the, the average was actually. Um, and then I've used it also to figure out what the top of this value, like I've kind of used it to figure out like where that median value is and the top of the median value. So it's useful for finding spots on a data set. You're like, I want to find the max, I want to find the min, I want to find the median, I want to find the end, I want to find the start. Very, very useful thing. That's why it's called select. Cool. Oh, group. Oh, I don't want to talk about group. No, 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 I'm not talking about group. Normalize. I like normalize. Um, normalize. It, 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 it's, it's normalized. It's, it, 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 it roots everything at the, the starting value, zero, and then um, it calculates the differences in, in the values when they go up and down based on their movement 
rather than their, their absolute value. Um, generally quite useful, as you can see, it's useful for a kind of chart like this. It's kind of, kind of funky. Um, and how do I do it? How do I do it, sorry? Well, I use this kind of normalized um, mark here, and then I take that normalized value, and then I cram it into a line. So you can kind of see, um, we can compose these kind of um, functions. We can normalize a value, and then we can find the last value of that normalized value, and then we can plot a, a label at the end of it if we really want. So you can kind of see that these things go through chains. Stack's fun. Stack is really fun. Um, what's Stack going to do? Um, values on top of each other, synthesize new Y values that have been stacked. Um, so it's, you know, binning them by date, it's figuring out what values need to be stacked on Y, it's filling them, um, and the thing, the thing that it distinguishes what needs to be stacked on top of each other is the fill, which is the cause in that situation. And then we take these and we, we give it to the area where it's common, takes those stuck values, works, right. Um, now, What's very really interesting is area Y has like an implicit stack transform built into it. Um, so it's just going to stack stuff by default. But there's a bunch of situations where you might want to use stack for like, you know, stacking values on top of each other. Um, or st stacking dots on top of each other. Which is a classic one is like dodge. Dodge is, dodge is effectively another vari variation of stack. So what's, what this does is it takes values that get like, or gets things that are drawn on top of each other. And it smears them out, dodges them. Um, so you can kind of create these swarm pots that look like this. Uh, it's very useful. Um, and then um, there's kind of a, a, a specific parameter, I forget what it's called, but it's like a repulsion value that figures out how much each value needs to get dodged away from each other. But once again, you can kind of see we're dodging on Y. We, we want the values to dodge and be repelled from the middle in either direction on the Y axis. And then once those have been dodged, we use the dot x mark to kind of pop them in a line. Make any sense? Sweet. Um, so yeah, it, it avoids pot, like pots that look like this. Um, I personally think this is a much better diagram than this. Um, and the really nice attribute of this is like, it, it rather than doing kind of like an area distribution, it still preserves um, the individual um, points that you can kind of like tooltip over. It's quite useful. Sweet. How am I going for time? 30 minutes. Sweet. Okay. Um, window. Window is another one. Once again, it's driving a new channel. Um, in this case, we are computing moving averages. Um, you can change the window width. It's kind of cool. Um, and so, yeah, once again, we're taking some sort of data set and we're deriving new channels um, that the, then we can plot. So you can kind of see, here's the original data set, in this case, area Y, um, and we are drawing some sort of like region um, through the middle, which is the, the low and the high temperature of the um, San Francisco weather. Um, and then we're asking, well, I want you to compute a window, a moving average um, across the, specifically the, low, the, the Y parameter, um, the low parameter, um, and also compute a moving average across the high, which is that, that, that red line. Um, and so you can kind of see, you know, how that works. It's, you know, sliding itself along the data set and it's deriving new Y values as it, as it moves along. Any questions? Cool. Okay. Right. That concludes the mark section. Oh.
Um, so faceting, faceting is not possible in some graph, uh, like visualization frameworks. Um, this is why we want to use a Grammar Graphics library, um, because it helps you draw subplots in a way that doesn't suck. Now, let's say, let's go back to the Olympians data set. Um, the Olympians data set, we're, we're going we're gonna to look at their heights. Imagine they're lining up against the wall and you're just drawing lines above their head and then you mark them on the wall and then you see where all the lines appear. Um, this is what it's going to kind of look like. Um, but we, we want to break this down. We want to we um, break it down based on the gender of the athlete. We want to break it down based on what sport they compete in, blah, blah, blah. So what we can do, this is a very standard, like, you know, barcode pop, you know, with the, the, the height is wide, right? Um, the stroke is the, you know, um, And if we keep going, well, what if we wanted, that's obviously a not a good graph. It's not very easy to see what's going on. So what we can do is rather we can use a dodge plot um, where we can take all those lines and we can kind of pull them out into this kind of what's called a violin plot. Um, the really nice part is it rather than drawing cuts, a violin plot is normally like a, a, a probability distribution. In this one, uh, we can we preserve the individual identity of every single person in that data set. Um, with one big caveat, uh, we've had to sample it. There's just too many entries in the data set, um, which is a bit of a problem um, when, we, when we're rendering like discrete elements. Um, so what we could do is we could say, well, we really want to compare um, two different sub-series of this data set. Um, what we can do is we can split those in the original barcode. Um, and we were able to split them like this, with this kind of stroke, we've changed the colour of each individual sub-series. We've changed it um, because uh, we only were plotting one uh, axis, and that one axis we, we were plotting was the y-axis. Um, each, individual, each individual data point that we were interested in was, the, was plotting the y. Um, now, what gets problematic, it gets, gets even worse, here's another one. Um, we, we do another one, we, we're kind of stacking it on top of each other, um, and we, we once again get the relative distributions out of the data set. But this is where faceting gets interesting. So what we've plotted here is we've actually plotted two interesting axes. Um, we've plotted both the height and the frequency, uh, and those are two linear axes. As you can see here, we had a height and an ordinal axis. Once again here, height, colour axis, here just a linear axis. So what if we wanted two linear axes and an ordinal axis? And that's what a facet does. So here we have two linear axes, one linear axis, another linear axis, another linear axis, another linear axis, and we've put another ordinal axis in. We've drawn two plots. This is kind of the beauty of fasting. It's an extra way to get even, like, plot on even more parameters of the data set. How have I achieved that? Well, I've achieved it with this FX encoding. It's saying facet on X. And so you can kind of see these two ordinal, ordinal um, we've created a new facet axis. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an X facet axis. If we go even further, um, well, there's that B-swarm that we saw before. Um, well, we can actually facet on that B-swarm if we really wanted to. Um, and there's now like a bunch of different axes here. There's, there's a linear axis here, there's a linear axis here, which is the relative um, density of um, the occurrence of that specific uh, height um, in, that, in, that, in that facet. Um, and then we also have an ordinal axis here. Um, and we can go even further. We can be like, well, what if we wanted to look at the breakdowns of heights based on the sport, um, as we can see here. Now this is getting kind of gnarly, you know, this is, it's kind of getting pretty hard to read. Um, so at this point in time, like, the kind of faceting on this basis is just not very nice. Um, and so you can kind of see how we've achieved this. Well, we've, we've got a dodge X, uh, their dots, and we've faceted on sport and six. And then finally, well, we've kind of gone back to bar charts. Like, what if we just facet on bars again? We kind of get back to those relative distributions. Um, this is kind of looking nicer again, a little bit easier to read. Um, and then after a while, you just kind of end up back at bar charts, uh, which we generally don't really like. Um, but, you know, this kind of achieves the needs that we, uh, the needs that we want. Um, 
Uh, so that's kind of like how we, how we generate those bar charts. So I think that's, that's the more interesting component, um, you know. Um, yeah, uh, cool. So that's kind of like faceting. So to summarize, what is faceting? It's like, it's not just like plotting on like two, uh, two axes. You can get lots more axes, you know. Um, we can have a total of four different axes that we can kind of um, start plotting things on. Not only that, we still have the color channel. We also have like relative area channels that we can do with dots. Um, so there's kind of like six degrees of freedom that you can uh, kind of operate um, with, uh, with these kind of static plots. Um, we're going to get to a few more later. Um, so yeah, like just, just go to going back again, like we're not, we're not limited to, like we can stack these on top of each other. Like if we like, we thought barcode plot was like a really useful plot. Um, we can take those barcode plots and put them on top of box plots. Um, box plots can be like kind of hard to read for people who aren't experienced with like reading them. Um, so you know you kind of get an at a glance perspective of what a, of like you can look at the kind of statistical metrics associated with the box plot, but you can kind of still get that kind of at a glance like intuitive feel of uh, distribution of a certain data set um, with a barcode plot. Ooh, okay. Um, how do I achieve that? Box Y, you know with the expected parameters, uh, and also just a tick X on the box of, uh, oh, Jesus Christ. Um, what did I do just there? Uh, whoa, we really scrolled a lot there. Um, uh, there we are, sorry, sorry folks. Uh, can anyone see the syntax error? I converted it into a text block. <laughs> there we are, um, whoopsie. Um, yeah, uh, as you can see, these, these have very, very similar parameter sets. Um, I've been able to layer these two different marks on top of each other, um, and yeah, kind of, very similar. Um, yeah, what, like, what's, what, how have I found that very useful? Here's like a plot I built a while ago. As you can see, I'm using like everything available to me. Like, um, we're looking at um, uh, individual swings on po in certain polling booths um, for each political party based on the median income where that booth is, right? Um, so like, let's like look at how many different axes I have. Well, I have a linear axis here, uh, I have a linear axis here, I have a facet ordinal axis here, I have another facet ordinal axis here, and I'm using colour, and I'm using the relative rotation of in these individual arrows, and I'm using their size based on the size of the electorate. Uh, yeah, so you can kind of see faceting really gives you a lot more degrees of freedom when constructing these plots. Um, so you can really cram a lot of stuff into them. Um, it's quite useful. Um, cool. So like, let's let's go from the top. Like, let's kind of like use all the tools that we kind of saw. Um, we're going to look at like a Walmart data set. And so what the Walmart data set is, is it's uh, a bunch of Walmarts opened in America over a long period of time. Actually, let's, let's actually pull up the data set. Um, and um, they opened on certain dates. Um, so we can just like build like a very simple plot. Um, we've been in uh, based on the date they opened. Um, uh, and, and we're just going to see like um, what, when, when did they open. open. Th there was a peak of them opening in 1990. Um, now, what we can do is we can put them on a map, which is kind of cool. Um, so there's this like, one last thing that I forgot to tell everyone about, which is called a projection. And projection sits between the scales and the screen space coordinates, and it takes, like it redirects, um, it, it, it's just, a projection is like this big mathematical function that like redirects the abstract coordinates onto the screen space. Um, so the projection we're using is called Albers USA, um, and so if it sees anything, if it sees any sort of, uh, if it sees any latitude and longitudes that like exist in the, like the Hawaii or like Alaska area, there's like a discontinuity where it like redirects where the, where the value has to be plotted. It's quite cool. Um, so what we can do is we can build a progressively, like we can build a faceted um, plot where we're showing progressively where um, all the Walmarts were opened. Um, over each decade. So 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and you kind of see the 2000s. How did I do that? With not much code. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, 
so like, like, let's break this down. The projection says Alba's USA, that's the thing that figure out, figures out how to get latitude and longitudes onto the, the, the reasonable screen space coordinates. Next up, we've, we've said we've faceted, um, and we're using this very odd parameter called interval, which is saying, look, I want you to build facets along this temporal um, facet. And we're, 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 saying, we're saying to Pot, look, I want you to facet by date. And it's seeing date, and it's like, I know those are dates. And then when it's faceted, it's binded based on 10 year bins. And it's taken the data for each of those bins, and then it's plotted the longitude and those latitudes, and it's given it to the Alba's USA projection, and it's plotted them onto the map. Um, and state mesh and um, nation is the, the outer geojson line that I just yanked off GitHub. Um, and then pots them onto it. So that's kind of like a tour de force of like why facets can be interesting because you can kind of like build these kind of like temporal facets where bins for each facet are getting put, well, data from, for each facet is getting put into an in, in individual subplot. Now, um, because we're on computers and we don't need to print things anymore, um, you might just say, well, why isn't that just an animation? Well, that's a great point. Here it is as an anima animation. Um, I picked a few things, I picked this kind of color scale to kind of represent the idea of, of like being put on white hot and then kind of cooled down as they get older. Um, so that's kind of like the kind of metaphor I was harping for there. Um, and so you can kind of see, it's, it does a decent job of showing that kind of spread um, over, over a long period of time and um, where the relative openings um, of the Walmarts were per year. Um, how did I achieve that? With very similar, uh, very similar amount of code, um, as you can see, there's that kind of fiddling that I had with the colour. Um, but I also have this like little extra parameter here, which is the year, and as, you, as I go along, that year value increments. Um, and I've just filtered the dots if the year date, like they, they don't exist before that year date. Um, and then I've filled the, the dot um, based on uh, how old the dot is. That's the kind of the age of the dot. Yeah, it's very, very similar code. Um, as you can see, I've yanked out the faceting code, so it's not getting binned on a per facet basis anymore. Cool. Yeah. Is that real time? Um, like, is it compiling all the graphs beforehand and just running it? Like oh, no, 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 this is dynamic. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, you can describe it very cool. Yeah. Funky. Um, yeah, um, this one is like one of my favorites. Um, of like how that kind of interactivity and using that like final axis, which is like the temporal axis, can be quite useful. Um, this kind of shows um, both like income and life expectancy of a bunch of different countries, um, like improving um, as the year goes along. The the size of the, the circle is the, the population of the country, um, and yeah, it, a, a, anytime you have a kind of year parameter, um, it gets very very useful to kind of create some sort of interactivity where things move and progress through the, through, through the graph. It's quite cool. Okay, that was a lot. Now I get to talk less about uh, graph and framework and more about like the kind of meta discussion associated with um, graphing. So if we have any questions about that last section, ask me that, yes. In that last one, the domain you have for the color was hard coded, is that, oh sorry, no, in the Walmart. The Walmart, yes. The um, color is zero to 44, is that? Is that just easy or is that something it can't figure out itself because of the animation? Uh, it just did something really weird and I don't know why. No. It just started, this thing started sliding and I just went, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm hard coding it. <laughs> the great part of graphic, like doing data visualization, if it looks right, it's probably correct. You know, you can do all sorts of hacks to like, you know, just make it look correct. No one's going to know. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. dimensionality reduction. Um, so dimensionality reduction, there's kind of like, if you've ever, what does UMAP stand for? Uniform manifold approximation of projection. Um, if you might have heard these like algorithms used in public, in, used online a few times. Um, I think, from my understanding, there is like use cases of them in some contexts other than data visualization. But there were too many problems with them in those contexts that people just say you just only use them for data visualization from now on. Um, what they are really useful for doing. They're useful for data visualization. Um, so let's look at MNIST. Um, MNIST, it's a data set of like handwritten um, numerals. Um, and um, it's a multi-dimensional data set. You've got all 
there, there's a lot of different values uh, in a lot of different parameters. Think of think of the different parameters that can vary in those that that kind of little whatever I think 64 by 64 dimensions. Um, this is what UMAP does when given that data set. Whoa. It clusters it, right? Um, you'll notice if I run this again, it is a, it, it's a stochastic process. Um, you'll get a different variation every time you run it. Um, and this is a, a one that was prepared earlier where they replaced the actual labels of the data set with their actual um, numerals. Um, you can kind of see down here, well, here are all the sixes, here are the fives, here's the sixes that kind of look like fives, and the fives that look kind of like sixes. Um, you, that, that's apparently, is that a nine? What, is that a six? Who knows? It's why it's up in the void, right? Um, so it's a really great way of clustering things by similarity. Um, now, here's a great one, um, fashion in NIST. Um, rather than being numbers, it is a big data set that is going to load. Uh, it's a big data set of images of fashion. Um, yeah, here we are. Um, and then what you can do is you can kind of kind of go random and it will give you a bunch of, like, you can see this is like the pants region. And if I go to a different <laughs> region, you know, these are, I don't know, one, uh, the green shirts, you know, like, um, so it, it's, it, it's clustering based on similarity, right? Now, um, I built a project based on something someone else had used a dimensionality reduction on, which was music genres. Um, it's really, really cool. Now, the really cool part is if you saw that one, well, this is a dimensionality reduction in two dimensions. So it's taken a bunch of a high dimensional data set and funded it down to two. Uh, here is a dimensionality reduction funded down to three, maybe four. I don't know how I feel about the colouring of these clusters. So I'm just going to refrain from having an opinion on that. This one, believe it or not, is three dimensions, except that third dimension colour is not linear. It is not a Euclidean, it's not a Euclidean mapping. Well, it's, it's a non-Euclidean mapping. As you can see, if we actually graph and we pull out that, that kind of colour mapping, um, in, it wraps around itself because it's a hue angle, right? Because it's, it's a colour circle, right? So whoever did this uh, has done a non-Euclidean dimensionality reduction. Uh, and to do a dimensionality reduction with UMAP, what you can do is yeah, spherical embeddings. I think you can just give it, you can just give it a distance function. You can give it an arbitrary distance function that it uses to compute between two different things that it's kind of comparing the relative distance to. So you can embed it in really, really crazy spaces. In this case, the person I assume the person who did this was like, I would love to have a colour channel that wraps around myself, and he's written a distance function where it's calculated um, you know, the modulus of 360 and then the absolute value in the distance function of the colour. It's very cool. Now, yes, they're useful for data visualization. Um, there is a bunch of stuff related to like misreading these, like you just there's a bunch of stuff that you, it, they can be very misleading. Um, so if you ever do data visualization and then do a dimensionality reduction, just keep in mind there's some pretty big caveats. Um, so this is the URL of this is misread TSNE, and I feel like someone got a little bit upset, and then they had to like rename it to how to use TSNE effectively. Um, but it can kind of go through a bunch of the extreme scenarios when you change the hyperparameters hyper of the algorithm. You can get into some weird scenarios where uh, it's kind of lying to you. So be very, very careful if you ever do use this. But obviously it's a very useful data visualization technique. And then understanding the UMAP can kind of show, like, once again, here's that fashion in this that we spoke about before. Um, if we can kind of go through, we can kind of see how this kind of like 3D woolly mammoth data set gets kind of flattened down to two dimensions and kind of modifying the hyperparameter kind of pre pre preserves locality from, from a global perspective. Do we need to... Pizza? No? no? We're still good. Pizza hasn't arrived yet. Okay, next up. Um, perceptual attributes of scales. If you're doing data visualization, um, you have to be careful um, about some like really interesting quirks of how people perceive stuff. Um, area is like a classic one of circles. Apparently this has an area of 10 and this has an area, relative area of 1. 
I don't know if that, does that feel like a 10 to you? Does that feel like a one to you? Um, circles can be like really confusing. It's why people don't recommend you use don't like pie charts, they trip people out. Um, uh, and yeah, you can, you can kind of see if we look at the, the R scale that it's kind of derived us. Um, yeah, you know, the, it, it, I've just, I've plotted the R parameter and I've plotted the, um, the, the, the area that's, yeah. It, it, it's trying to preserve the area. That, that's what it's trying to do. <laughs> uh, I kind of reverse engineered that one. Um, now, um, if you used a, like for example, this is a, 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 a timeline of bank failures and then the size of the bank that failed and then they've been dodged and stacked on top of each other. Now, you might be like forgiven for thinking that there are like a lot more money got wiped out um, in the 2007 crash than the, some of the most recent crash, but like that's not true. More money got wiped out. So there's problems with the circle, you know, like you can eyeball and you go, ah, you know, small, big, you know, it's like, ah, big, you know. Um, so yeah, be very, very careful when you use circles and particularly when you stack them and dodge them and all sorts of stuff. Um, next up, color. Um, so what's fun is um, data visualization frameworks have color maps that preserve interesting properties. Um, so typically they'll use a state-of-the-art color model, um, which are all designed to be what's called perceptually uniform, which is based on a bunch of experimental data and what people feel and observe about certain color sets. Um, and so if we kind of go through a bunch of like inbuilt data sets, you can kind of see they're like nice flowing curves throughout the color models, or they're just like relatively straight lines. Um, and depending on the color model that they're built off, they'll be, they'll be straight in that color model, for example. Um, so you can kind of see some, like Viridus has this like really nice like line with its like luminance value. You know, it goes from like dark to light and it's very straight in that kind of, in that mapping. Um, some are what are called diverging. Um, for example, let's say you were going like cold, like one is like cold or hot, for example, or like you're looking at altitude. There's a bunch of diverging data sets or like electoral swings, all that kind of stuff. You kind of want, you want the luminance to go up and you want it to go down. So there's a bunch of built-in ones that are all very, very nice. Now, be very careful because um, some people can interpret um, some colors as being identical under color vision deficiencies. Um, so here's something I did a little bit earlier where I took a bunch of the color maps and crammed them into color vision deficiency simulator. Now, if you look at Civitas, um, Civitas is one that's going to be built to a, a bunch of data visualization frameworks. It was specifically designed to have identical performance across all um, color vision deficiency situations. So I would recommend, one, checking that your data visualizations look right to be, uh, and then putting into a color vision deficiency simulator. Um, checking that, uh, use Civitas by default, um, and um, and, and sometimes Inferno or Magma or Plasma are useful if you want to like hark into some sort of like metaphor that, that you're kind of like trying to convey or cause that kind of stuff. Um, Cube Helix, despite being based on a RGB color model, is like reasonably well performing, which I don't know why. So I want someone to come along and build a better version of Cube Helix. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Oh, one final thing. Um, Simpsons Paradox. Does everyone know about Simpsons Paradox? No? Okay, cool. Um, this is a penguin, uh, it's got a beak, common length, big dip, right? Um, three different breeds of penguins, very fun. Uh, if you were to plot this and then plot a confidence interval through the data set, you may believe that common depth is negatively correlated with common length. Uh, and if we put the stroke species parameter, we all of a sudden see that that relationship inverts itself. Um, yeah. So be very careful. Um, if you're ever computing star summary statistics against an aggregate data set, make sure that it doesn't invert itself when you plot it against the subseries. So yes, be very, very, very careful about that, as usual. Woo! Okay, there's a part two. How are we going for time? Good. Alright, awesome. Ah, uh, okay. Data plane management. Now, in any sort of um, data visualization situation, um, look, most people are going to do data visualizations in a few different contexts. 
They're either going to do it locally, uh, and um, if you have a really, really big data set, you're just going to wait for it to like, it's going to be a 10 minute render, and you're going to take an image, uh, and you're going to dump it in some sort of situation. Or you're going to use some sort of like, like you're going to use Spark, or you're going to use some sort of like large scale um, MapReduce framework, um, where you can just be a bit of an idiot with managing the performance of your data set. Um, but there are some situations where you need things to be reactive and you need them to be fast and you can't afford it for it to be slow. Uh, and you need it to render quickly. Um, now, um, let me talk about some techniques to make sure that that can happen. Um, one, which is uh, a decent one, is sometimes uh, you want data to kind of come in uh, progressively. Um, so here's a little demo of like what that would mean. Um, for example, I built this kind of little function called accumulate. And what it will do is it will take uh, some sort of arbitrary iterator, it will iterate through the values um, if they're yielded asynchronously, and it will put them into some uh, intermediate, um, uh, it will put, put them in some sort of collector, um, and then it will yield the current value of the collector every time it sees a new value. And then uh, what I've done, so for example, if you have this async generator, well, what's async generator? Well, it's a, it's a generator, it yields a value, waits a little while, yields two, waits a little while, yields three, waits a little while, yields four, two, right? Um, and then if I were to, say, run, uh, accumulate against that, what will happen is it's getting the value, and then it's accumulating it, and then it's going to yield another value, and then it's going to yield another one. So it's kind of, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's an asynchronous accumulation of data. Now, this seems like very contrived, but there's a situation that you will definitely encounter this, and that's like with paged APIs. An API that progressively yields data, and you have to kind of churn through the different pages of the API, and you accumulate it as a long period of time. Now, that very much happens in a lot of situations where you have some sort of API where you need to data visualize. Um, so, a great way, so here's like a paginated API function. What it's gonna do is it's gonna go to the GitHub API, it's gonna get the response, and it's gonna it's going to get the next link, and then it, and then it's going to progressively churn its way through the pages. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this paginated API function, which is going to is constantly giving out the new pages, and I'm going to give it to accumulate. And what will happen is then. Um, so this is I think a bunch of stars related to a certain project. Um, so yeah, it, it's really useful. It, you, you kind of have to be mindful, like there's kind of situations where um, you don't want people to sit like waiting and staring at a wide screen. You want to progressively load, load your data. Um, so like generators, iterators, um, streams are like really, really good for kind of building that like kind of nice user experience. Whew. Okay, next one. Um, next up, Parquet. Um, Parquet is the kind of um, standard data interchange format uh, that a lot of people are standardizing on for like storing like large statistical data sets. Um, like not SQLite, not CSV, uh, maybe Apache Arrow, but that's kind of losing the Parquet. Um, so what's interesting about Parquet is it has a column-based data format um, rather than a row-based format. So like a SQLite file, for example, row-based format. Um, and column-based format, all the data for each individual like um, attribute uh, is stored in one like kind of linear linear stream. Um, so you just don't have to load the parts of the data set that you don't care about. If you only care about two columns, only load two columns. So um, generally, um, you can get some really, really nice space saving um, um, at, out of that because you can run length in code. Um, for example, if you have uh, a single attribute is like one for a bunch of instances, what you can do is you can run length in code, like I saw one in this column for like 5,000 instances, and then right at the end it was zero, right? That compresses very, very nicely when you kind of keep those values next to each other. So yeah, um, I, got this, I got this data set, 34 megabytes down to seven. I got this one from 300 down to four, that was really, really, really nice. Um, and that meant I could just like host it online um, and um, that, that gets very nice because from an interactivity perspective, you don't need to push 300 megabytes down to someone's device. Um, they can use the whole data set in memory and you can kind of manipulate it. You can, they can search against it. They can, they can run online queries against that data set. 
Tidy data, I'm not going to talk about that, I ran out of time. Um, partial data, partial reading. I tried to do a demo of partial reading. Um, because Parquet files, they come with a metadata block where it defines the relative offsets of where the columns are. So I hoped what I was going to be able to demo was me loading a Parquet file that I had hosted on a remote server and then I was going to... Um, where did I put it? Where did I put that code? I deleted it before. Um, I was going to load the database from a remote data store and I hoped what it was going to do was inspect that metadata block at the head of the Parquet file and not download the whole file. And it started downloading the whole file. It started downloading 300 megabytes. So I didn't get to do this kind of like um, cool demo um, where you can host you know, your large data sets remotely um, and not download all of it. That kind of sucks. So I ended up just downloading it um, and like um, using DuckDB. Um, so for context, DuckDB is an OLAP database. Um, it's designed for large scale statistical programming. It's design uh, statistical data, um, data analysis. It's designed for column based data formats and has a bunch of algorithms optimized for that use case. It's not for like large scale transaction processing like SQLite or like Postgres, etc. Um, so what I did is I, I imported that, that this data set. Um, this data set is a um, New York Taxis data set. Um, and um, here, as you can see, um, I, I wanted to look at like a latency related data set because um, I think it has some interesting um, UX affordances. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the wait time. Someone's like, I need a taxi. That's the request time. And then the pickup date time. And then the wait time is just the delta between those. Right? Um, and so what I can do is, because that Parquet file is like very compressed and very, very local, I can run SQL queries dynamically against it. Um, now, this is how I think you should do any, short, any sort of data visualization against um, a latency-based data set, which you will encounter at some point in your life. Um, there's a few layers of this. One is a heat map. Um, what you want to do is you want to bin um, uh, here. You want to bin your like your latency data uh, on your y axis, um, and you want to fill it in based on the kind of relative count of, of each of those. And then what you want to do is you definitely want to compute uh, compute a moving average, and the moving average is you want to compute a p50, the p95, or p99. Uh, sorry, p50, p90, p95, or p99. Um, you know your your kind of percentiles. Um, and so those are very, very useful for figuring out, well, what is the median, what is the average experience um, that, for example, let's say you are Uber, you're very much interested in what the average experience of your users are, that's your P, 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 P50, uh, then your P90 and your P95 and the P99 are the people who complain and pick up the phone and say, where the hell's my taxi, you know? <laughs> um, and so you definitely want to plot those outliers. Uh, and any time you get like to this situation, someone who's waited Six minutes instead of four is not going to complain. But as soon as your P95 and, or, well, in this case, your P95 and your P99 has blown out the top of the chart, now you're starting to get people complaining and whinging. So um, any sort of time you do this kind of data analysis, that's a very, very useful attribute to kind of look at. So um, what's very interesting here is this, um, this brought the computer to its knees. Um, why? To compute those moving averages, it was having to go through the entire data set and calculate the percentiles, the P50, P90, P95, right? That's like really, really painful for it to do. Um, so there is a kind of grouping of algorithms that are kind of useful for doing this kind of processing. It's called statistical estimator. No one has online statistical estimators. Now, hypothetically, if you had a list and you wanted to calculate how many elements in a list there were, well, that's very, very easy to do. You just go through every element and increment a counter. If you wanted to calculate the size of a set that hadn't been deduplicated yet, that's very, that's much more difficult. Because anytime you see a value, you have to go back and you have to figure out, well, wait, have I seen this value or not? The cardinality of the set is a much more difficult estimation, right? So if you've ever heard of a bloom filter, a bloom filter is a statistical um, algorithm or statistical data structure for figuring out whether an element is a member of a set. And the algorithm gives you one of two answers. Is it in the set? No. Or is it in the set? Maybe. And here's some kind of 
expect, like, percentage chance that I think it might be in the data set, depending on the saturation of the data set. Now, hyperlog log is, once again, an online probabilistic algorithm that figures out the cardinality of a set. And it uses kind of a hash, and it like, kind of layers hashes on top of each other, and it figures out how many times there's hash collisions and certain blocks of stuff to kind of give some sort of estimate. Um, this is a really good YouTube video on it, right? But we also have online statistical estimators for, you know, um, you know, like quantile sketches, P90, uh, P50, P75, etc. Right? Um, and DuckDB, being a database that is designed for large-scale statistical analysis, has these inbuilt. Um, so what we can do is we can not bring the computer to its knees, uh, and we can kind of use a kind of like window quantile sketch. Uh, as, as you can see, here are those uh, P, P50, P90, it's P95, P99s that I want to compute. It's a, going to move a moving window across this data set, um, and it is not going to have to keep track of every single data. It's going to do a statistical estimate that has some degree of error, but as the data set is particularly large, it's not going to be up by a significant margin. Um, and so here is the much faster rendering version of that previous chart, um, and rather than using um, uh, plot inbuilt window Y um, using the P90 reducer and uh, and this and this window, which is um, eight hours, um, we we uh, where's the data? Where's the data? Where's the data? What the hell have I done? I have deleted the cool part where I go through. Ah, yeah. Whoa! I've, I've completely fucked this chart up. Sorry. <laughs> um, but. This, here I'm getting the PXX values um, that the database has yielded, but I'm also windowing them for some reason. Um, so I actually have a double smoothed um, P, the double smoothed estimates, which is why they look, it's why they look different from the ones you saw before. Um, so I'll fix that later. But yes, um, if you if your data set set gets too big, use a database uh, that that can actually visualize things. Uh, or can calculate statistical, statistical estimates, take those statistical estimates and cram them into the visualization framework rather than bring it to its knees. Okay, cool. Yes. Does that fit with the principle before where we should not do any data manipulation before we give it to the channel? Yes, but <laughs> sometimes the rules must be broken for performance reasons. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Don't, don't prematurely optimize, you know. Um, in this case, we've had to optimize. Um, so yeah, um, look, that concludes the talk. Um, this, that was tricky. I forgot a lot about what I was going to say. Um, so I hope you all liked it. Um, but I wrote a lot of prose, um, and the code all works, and I, I've spent, I spent a lot of time writing these graphs and making them good. So I really recommend, like, if you have any questions, kind of come back to the you notebook know, and you can ping me and ask me about any specific cells. Um, here are my favorite notebooks. Um, I've chosen a lot that are like very prosy. Um, I really like this one. Um, I think you have to like you have to remember um, the point of data visualization is to like tell and convey a story to people. Um, and if these if these visualizations load, like it's very like you can kind of see there's very much a story being told here. It's kind of like looking at the progression of some sort of event annotating it with kind of like interesting prose and details and that kind of stuff. It's, it's very important, like don't lose sight of what you're trying to do when you're doing data visualization. You're trying to communicate, you're trying to convince, you're trying to, you're trying to um, investigate, you're trying to make a decision. Um, and, and, and just as much, about, uh, the, like you can be a very good technical uh, data visualizer, but if you're not uh, a good storyteller, if you don't, uh, think about what you're kind of trying to visualize and think about the implications of it, um, you're not going to do a very good job overall. So, yeah, um, really look at other people, like some author's work. I love this guy, Bartosz. Uh, he does some really, really amazing stuff, particularly with like 3D data visualizations. I'm really impressed by his stuff. Read some, some of this kind of stuff. Get an idea of how they communicate and convey this kind of information and details um, if you want to be better. Um, so, yeah. Um, I want to go and do some of the other stuff. I didn't get to do like geospatial visualization. Um, I, I didn't get to talk about GeoJSON. I didn't get to talk about some of this other stuff like tidy data. Um, so I have to talk to talk about it at another point. And then finally, um, 
yeah, I have a, a, a bunch of visualizations of my own on my own personal website. Um, I kind of got it sucked into a bit of a hole there for a while, so I, I did a lot of work. Um, these are all the kind of data sets I used, and then finally a bunch of other references that I used to make the talk. It's me. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you again Max. Thank you. Um, I see you've already stolen yeah, our UQCS mug for you. Thank you. I didn't um, get a trance to drink out of it unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have pizza outside and otherwise thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Um, before I go, can I just put, I'm just going to put the URL of the talk on the screen if anyone wants to see it. Just for like, uh, just for like uh, live stream people in case someone will go afterwards. Oh my god that did not work. Oh come on. Anyway, I'll keep it like that. Thank you. <laughs>